Hey guys, welcome to Give Your Grades a Glow Up. Today we're going to be looking at a poem from the Power and Conflict Cluster. We're going to be looking at Bayonet Charge by Ted Hughes. And say something. Hey baby, Ooh. <laughs> ah, I want to know. That Ted Hughes sounds different. I don't even know the song. <laughs> what is it? Will you be my girl? girl. The poem is set in the middle of a battle and a soldier wakes up and he's running. He doesn't know why he's running, but he's running. And he's charging forward with his bayonet, which is a blade attached to the end of a gun. And he's on the battlefield and he pauses and he thinks, why am I even here? And then suddenly he sees a hare in front of him and the hare is suffering and dying in front of him and he realises the danger that he's in. So the chaos of the war is all around him and he realises in that moment that war is inherently senseless. He has this epiphany that all those values of fighting for your country and being a hero, it's all pointless. He is most likely going to become nothing more than a statistic one of the many lives wasted by a war. But it's too late for him now to do anything about it because he's there. So basically, the poem depicts the thoughts and feelings of one soldier as he charges at the enemy and then begins to question his role in the battle. Let's read it. Suddenly, he awoke and was running. Raw in raw steamed hot khaki, his sweat heavy, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire, hearing bullets smacking the belly out the air. He lugged a rifle numb as a smashed arm, the patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the centre of his chest. In bewilderment then, he almost stopped. In what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations was he the hand pointing that second? He was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running. And his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. Then the shot flashed furrows threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide open, silent its eyes standing out. He plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. King, honour, human dignity, etc. drop like luxuries in a yelling alarm to get out of that blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. It is a little bit confusing if you have never read through this poem before. It seems complicated, but I promise you're going to love it. We're going to work our way through this poem bit by bit, figure out exactly what's going on. And as we do that, I'm going to give you at least three juicy quotations. And by juicy, I mean quotations that have interesting language devices, words that you can zoom into and we're going to look at those quotes in real detail so if this poem comes up in your exam you are able to write at least three detailed analytical paragraphs about it let's start from the beginning the poem begins in media res which is a very posh way of saying in the middle of the action and it plunges the reader and the soldier into the battle simultaneously it's an abrupt opening. Suddenly he awoke, he's running. It immediately creates the feeling of danger and it recreates that feeling of chaos in the war. He's in a liminal state, half asleep, half awake. And it's very different to the typical representation of the heroism of war. You think everyone's like switched on, fighting, swords are out, but he's like, still half asleep. And I think it's really clever because he's literally awakening, but he's also metaphorically awakening to the horror and the futility of war. So it's the notion of waking up, which suggests that he's exiting a dream and entering reality. So he's literally heading away from the illusory idea 
of war that he once believed to be true into the true terror of armed conflict. It says, raw in raw scene hot khaki, his sweat heavy. Now the word raw is a homograph, as in words that are spelt the same but have a different meaning. So it's used twice here, it's repeated in different senses. Firstly, it describes the soldier's emotions, his fear, his desperation, and the second time it describes his uniform. Now the word raw has connotations of animals, which shows the lack of humanity in war. And it also makes the soldier seem really vulnerable. You know, if something's raw, it can get hurt easily. The hyperbole in his sweat heavy, obviously his sweat's not heavy. It emphasizes his fear. His fear is like weighing down on him. And it says, stumbling across a field of clods towards a green hedge that dazzled with rifle fire, hearing bullets smacking the belly out of the air. We can look at this quotation in deep detail. The verb stumbling makes the soldier seem clumsy and disorientated. He was thrown into this battle unprepared. And it's ambiguous. Is he stumbling because he's injured? Is he tired? Is he weak? We don't know. The image of a field of clods, clods are like a lump of earth. It describes how the battlefield has been destroyed by war. So it emphasizes how brutal war is. The fact that he's going towards a green hedge, if we zoom into that color imagery, green has connotations of life and growth and purity, plants are green. And he's running towards mother nature for salvation. It's untouched nature amongst a ruined landscape, or metaphorically, it's a symbol of hope amongst the surrounding devastation. But immediately, Hughes uses enjambment to show hope doesn't last very long, it's short-lived, because that purity is dazzled with rifle fire. He's running towards the hedge, but it's on fire because of the bullet. Also, the fact that the hedge is dazzled with rifle fire, that's the only indication of the enemy's presence. The green hedge that dazzled the rifle fire, the, en the enemy is unseen. You can't see them, but it makes them seem even more frightening. It's like they're even more unpredictable. That hedge is on fire. I know the enemy is somewhere, but I can't see them. If we zoom into the word fire, that's religious imagery and fire is associated with hell and suffering, which is what the soldier is enduring. Then it says bullets smacking the belly out of the air. So it personifies the bullets as being violent and they are being terrifying. Even the air is being attacked here. He cannot escape. The word smacking is actually onomatopoeic it evokes the reader's senses. So the reader can hear the punishment. They can hear the violence. There's also bilabial plosive alliteration, which creates a harsh and aggressive tone, b -b -b, which mimics the sound of his beating heart, highlighting how scared he is. Or it could be mimicking the sounds of the explosions around him. He loves a rifle numb as a smashed arm. That's a simile and it describes how the soldier is struggling to carry the weight of his rifle. So he is physically weak and the rifle is useless. It's like a smashed arm. It can't really protect him and support him. The patriotic tear that had brimmed in his eye, sweating like molten iron from the center of his chest. We can look at this in more detail. Let's analyze it. It's quite a juicy quote. The tear could have brimmed in the soldier's eye due to the physical pain he was in. So his eyes are watering or perhaps from exertion. He's tired, his eyes are watering. Or it could be because of the psychological toll of the war, like crying. Hughes labels the tear as patriotic, symbolizing how the soldier was unable to see the reality of war because he was blinded by false expectations, like a tear disrupts your vision. You can't see clearly if your eyes are watering. But the past tense, had, 
reveals he once believed in this propaganda, but now he understands it was all a lie. Everything they told him about war being great, heroes, yeah, glory, all a lie. The tear is described as then sweating like molten iron from the center of his chest. And that simile shows how the soldier is losing his patriotism, his love for his country. And he's become dehumanized. You don't actually sweat out molten iron. So there's a juxtaposition between the psychological brainwashing, patriotism, and the visceral physical reality of war. The center of his chest is where his heart is. So he's losing the love for his country. Next stanza, it says in bewilderment, then he almost stopped. So he stops and the dash at the end of the line recreates that pause in his running, as well as reflecting the shift in his mindset. This is a moment where he's gonna pause and really think about it. He says, in what cold clockwork of the stars and the nations, was he the hand pointing that second? Let's analyze this, it's a question, we should talk about it. He's saying, War itself is because of hostilities between nations and countries. And he realizes that he is nothing more than a tool of war. He is just the hand in a clock that points to the seconds. He's just a tiny little part that helps the clock work, helps the war happen. Without these soldiers, wars cannot function. Without the second hand, a clock can't work. It's not possible. But he's being used. He's being exploited by much larger and more powerful forces. The fact that he's comparing himself to a part of a clock, an object, human to object, is cremomorphism. Hughes is highlighting how soldiers are objectified. They are replaceable. If a hand stops working, you just get a new one. So they're treated as disposable. Chuck that one away, that one died, get a new one. It's also, I think it's really interesting, he uses time as a symbol. So Hughes suggests that the soldier is conscious of his limited time. Now the rhetorical question creates a really reflective tone. He's considering his position, like, am I really? and his purpose in the war he's questioning, he's realizing that his urge to protect his country is not going to be returned. His country is not going to protect him from the horrible reality he now finds himself in. The guttural alliteration, cold clockwork, creates a harsh, aggressive sound and it emphasizes his suffering. It says, he was running like a man who has jumped up in the dark and runs listening between his footfalls for the reason of his still running. And his foot hung like statuary in mid-stride. So as well as reiterating his disorientation, he's questioning his purpose once again. He stopped like with his leg up in the air, like you're running and then you stop. And it says, then the shot flashed furrows. Furrows are trenches made for planting. So rural imagery has been subverted here to create a juxtaposition between the nourishing connotations of farming and life being taken away in the same place. In the next stanza, it says, threw up a yellow hair that rolled like a flame and crawled in a threshing circle, its mouth wide open silent, its eyes standing out. Let's analyze that. Firstly, the hair is yellow color imagery has been used. Yellow has connotations of happiness and hope, but the hair looks like it's on fire. So all hope has been burnt, demolished, finished. And the imagery of the hair crawling makes it seem innocent, like a baby. It's powerless, it's helpless, it can't defend itself. And it's moving in a threshing circle. Threshing means moving violently, like thrashing around. So he's injured. And it's mouth wide open, which describes how the hair is suffering so intensely. And with its eyes standing out, it looks like it's about to die from its injuries. It's like mouth wide is out of shock and fear. And these circular motions give the impression that the hair is trapped. Both the hare and the soldier are caught up in a deadly situation in someone else's battle.
Perhaps the hare dying is a metaphor for the soldiers that died on that very battlefield or for the devastating impact that war has on the natural world. That is further reinforced with the use of enchantment. The line has been broken because it goes on to the next line, that sentence. And it's like war has broken him. Now, me personally, and this is just my interpretation, I wonder, is there even a hair? Because when I read it, I almost feel like the hair is just a reflection of the soldier. It's like a physical manifestation of his shock, his fear, his confusion, as if the hair is mirroring how the soldier feels, his bewilderment. And then it says he plunged past with his bayonet towards the green hedge. So he keeps running basically. And there's a cyclical structure because he's running again. And that green hedge has been mentioned again. So he snapped out of his reflection and he's looking to survive. And it says, king, honor, human dignity, etc., drops like luxuries and yelling alarm. So asyndetic listing is used here to show he has abandoned all of his previous motivation to fight. And the word etc. undermines the triplet. Da, 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 etc. So it undermines the triplet preceding it, coming before it, confirming how king, honor, human dignity, they are meaningless to the soldier now. He's lost those beliefs in a yelling alarm, signifying his fear and his almost animalistic desperation to survive. I think the etc. contrasts with whatever romanticized notions the soldier might have had about war before going into the battle. So the poet undermines the usual rhetoric of war, the usual way war is described. King, honor, you've got to fight for your country, human dignity, and then he just dismisses it, etc. During battle, these concepts drop like luxuries. So for those directly involved in the fighting, belief in these ideas is self-indulgent and irrelevant and you've got to abandon it to survive. These concepts are hollow and meaningless in the brutal realities of war. Only if you're not in war are you gonna be like, yep, fight in war, my people. Glory, glory, hero, hero, but when you're actually in it and you're having to actually risk your life and everything's on fire and you're waking up and you're being asked to run and you've got a knife and a gun, you don't care about that stuff anymore. It's, it's not, you're not going to be holding onto this like, love for your country when you're gonna end up dead, is what he's trying to say. To get out of that blue crackling air, his terror's touchy dynamite. So the blue crackling air is a metaphor for the gunfire in the air around him. The crackling is onomatopoeic, it's a sound word. It's an example of sensory language and it's used to paint a vivid picture of the brutality of the battlefield. And then it says, his terror's touchy dynamite. I always found that line really confusing, but now I find it really interesting. Dynamite is an explosive. It's a symbol of destruction and terror. And he's basically saying it's his fear and his terror that will end up killing him, not some enemy. So touchy is how sensitive he is. He's on the brink of imploding. You touch him, he's, he's gonna explode. He has lost all humanity and he has become a weapon of war. Isn't it interesting that the soldier is the only person described in this poem? His comrades are not mentioned. No one's mentioned, it's just him. And it's quite surprising, a battlefield in reality would be filled with people that this sense of isolation makes the moment more intense the soldier is fighting on his own for his own survival and everything else is irrelevant no one else can help him defend him structurally the poem is chaotic there is no fixed rhyme scheme no fixed stanza length and that mimics the chaos and the panic of war There you go with your analysis. We've looked at language devices, we've looked at structure, we've picked out some of our favorite quotations. But in your exam, if you're looking to get a grade seven to nine, you need to do a little bit more than that. You also need to bring in something called context. And what that means is you need to talk about what was happening during the time the poem was written, or tell me a bit about the poet's life, and then link that to the message of the poem, 
the writer's intention, like why did they write the poem? What were they trying to say to the reader? Some interesting context points for Bayonet Charge are, Ted Hughes was a famous war poet. However, since he wasn't alive during World War I and he was only a child in World War II, he never fought in a war or saw it firsthand. Hughes grew up in the post-war era and saw its influence in his home in Yorkshire. And this rural upbringing is evident in his poetry, which usually focuses on animals. Hughes studied mythology and anthropology, which is the study of human behavior. Hence, this poem includes the image of the hare, which links to mythology, and it also explores instinctual behavior. The poem is from the collection, The Hawk in the Rain, which he dedicated to his wife, Sylvia Plath, who was also a famous writer. And the poem was published in 1957, but was set in World War I. His poems were a way for him to make sense of the events he never saw, but whose impacts were seen daily. His dad fought in World War I and was one of only 17 men from his regiment to survive the Gallipoli campaign, which left his father emotionally traumatized for life. So it is thought that Hughes wanted to highlight the brutality of war as a tribute to his father's suffering and also warning future generations. Now this poem was also greatly inspired by Wilfred Owen, who wrote Exposure, who similarly tried to depict the reality of war in his poetry. Isn't that fascinating to have like a dad who was a soldier and the son becomes a poet and writes about war? I think that's really cool. Right, there you have it. A full analysis of Bayonet Charge. I hope you found this video useful. If you did, please give it a like and don't forget to check out the rest of the videos in this series.